I just want to take this in. You know? See the view out there? Yeah. Holy moly. <laughs> Beautiful. It's not perfect. I know. <laughs> Over there. We're surrounded by such beauty. I think one of the ways to live our happy, which is this message I like to share on an ongoing basis. I don't know if you guys got the memo, but Jesus is telling us that our function is happiness. Have you heard it? You know, have you read it in the, the course lessons? My function is happiness, right? God's will for you is happiness. I can't get over how many times in the Course in Miracles you hear or you read happiness. So one of the ways I feel to experience that happy place is through gratitude. So I want to just right now express that gratitude of the opportunity that we've given ourselves to remember that we are in the mind of God. So before I begin, I always like to start with setting up the energy for the session and an intention. I know that we began with an overall intention for the weekend, but I do want to set an intention for this moment, for this next hour that we're together. So let's close our eyes and just take a deep breath here. And you visualize a ball of golden light on top of your head as you see as that light starts shining through your eyes, your nose, your mouth. That ball of golden light goes down your neck and your heart. And possibly the color changes in the heart. What color is that light in your heart? See, as that light goes down your body, your chest, your abdomen, your hips, all the way down to the tip of your toes, and you feel relaxed. And you feel peace. And if a thought comes in, you just simply say, I'll be with you later. I'm willing to be here now. And experience the freedom. that God wants me to experience within my mind. At this time, you see an altar, you visualize an altar. As you place your intention for the session on the altar, it could be one intention or a few intentions. It could be being present. It could be having the opportunity to see an area of your life differently through Christ's vision. It could be being willing to let go of a grievance. And you put the intention on the altar. As a symbol of giving it over to God. As a gift. As we place no idols before God. As we declare in the silence, may it be God's will. May it be God's will. On the altar now, you 
give over any barriers, anything you want to let go of, or anything you think you need. You put it on the altar now as a gift. Maybe you wrap them up. And you give them individually to God. Getting out of your own way. As you declare in the silence again, may it be your will, God. And now, towards the end, you see a door. And you know that behind the door, there's a lot of love. And you walk, and you open the door, you walk in, and we're all there in this space, in this room. And we're just filled with gratitude for showing up and for doing our part. Not only for ourselves, but for our brothers and sisters. As we get out of our way, and allow Holy Spirit to shine light. And we're able to experience collectively our function, which is happiness. Our commitment to recognizing that we are in the mind of God. We invite the Holy Spirit to the session to guide it on what to say, what to do, questions that need to be asked that are the highest best for the sonship of awakening. And we're trusting. You think of your intention again as we start to come back to the space. You bring your awareness back without opening your eyes. Possibly you move your feet and your hands and you just start to come back. In gratitude. And again, you declare maybe God's will in the silence. And when you're ready, there's no rush. When I see everyone has their hand on their heart, we're going to put our hands on our hearts when you're ready. With your eyes closed. Let's just take a deep breath here. All together, I am love. I am love. And I am willing. And I am willing. Amen. Amen. Very good. Keep your eyes when you're ready. How did that feel? Delicious! <laughs> Delicious! <laughs> All right. Um, I had an experience, a um, mystical experience, when I was eight. And I haven't really talked about this in a presentation before, but I felt called to as I was walking here. And I remember sitting on the couch and feeling a presence next to me on the couch. It's, it wasn't that I saw a body or an image, it was more of that there was an energy next to me. And I remember asking the energy, what are you? And I remember the energy saying, and I had never heard this before, I had only heard the words God and Jesus at this time through my brother. He was Catholic and he was the one that taught me how to pray and took me to church. And the voice says, I'm Holy Spirit. And that's when I was eight years old. And after that, I just started to have um, this amazing relationship with with Jesus and God as I would go to Catholic, Catholic Mass with my parents. And I would have a picture of Jesus and I would give him M&M's. <laughs> I would put M&M's. I thought maybe he might like some chocolate. <laughs> See how beautiful we are, we're so innocent, we're so open. 
There's so much trust. And then life started to happen. And then I began to forget my calling and forget my purpose. Because then I started to be asked, so what are you going to be? What religion are you going to be? And I was like, well, I'm going to be Catholic because that's the cool thing to do. You know, all my friends are going to, is it cat, Catholic? Catechism, yeah. Sometimes I forget my English, so I'm going to be asking you. And I, I went, and I wanted to be Catholic because everybody was Catholic. And I had forgotten about Holy Spirit. I had forgotten what my purpose was, which was really no religion, right? So I get to the first class, and they start speaking about different things. And they bring up that um, same sex couldn't be married. They start talking about the rules. And I started to get a little bit antsy. And I'm not saying that Catholic religion is bad or good. I'm just sharing my experience. I actually love the churches, the Catholic churches. I think they're absolutely beautiful. Can we say that? With the stained glass windows and also the beautiful rituals. There's something to say about that, right? But there was something they were saying that was just not in alignment to what my path was. And then they were also saying that you couldn't have, you know, before you got married. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if there's kids here, but you guys know what I'm saying, right? You can't. Whatever, before you get married. And then I was like, huh, that's weird, right? <laughs> thank you. Just didn't know, you know, there was any, any young kids here, so I want to thank you. <laughs> and then throughout that, it was, a, it, was a, it was a retreat, it was a retreat, and then they told me that I had to go speak to the priest to confess my sins. And then I started to be, get very annoyed. I was like, well, what do you mean? Well, you need to confess your sins and then you will be forgiven. And I said, very innocently, because I knew this, I said, I've done nothing. I said that, I said, I haven't done anything. I have nothing to say. And I said, because I am a perfect child of God. It's like, I knew. And then I went home to make a long story short, and I told my parents, I have no, I'm not gonna have any religion. And my parents were, it was so beautiful because my mom was Catholic and my brother, my dad was Presbyterian and my dad says, oh, so then you'll be Presbyterian? <laughs> and I was like, no, no. So forward ahead, um, I, I discovered something in my early 20s, which was, which was this thing that's called depression. They don't teach it at school. I started to feel sad all of a sudden. I mean, very sad. Um, I was, it was just in a crisis. I didn't know what my purpose was. If, um, just so some people know my background, as Cheryl was sharing with my bio, that um, I was act, TV hosting and acting um, since I was about maybe 15. I started to get into modeling and then I started to get into television. So that was my identity. That defined me. So going to an audition, booking a job, that defined me. My, my job defined me. And then in my early 20s, I was like, what do I do? Like, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? And I started to go through a depression. And I was at a bookstore, and I was, I found Marion Williamson's book, Return to Love. This was in 1995. And um, I read it, and in, inside of it, all she says all the time is this blue book, this blue book, this blue book, and I'm like, what the hell is that blue book? <laughs> you know, I was just curious. And I didn't think about it again, and I was reading her books, her book at the time, and I was just going through a major depression. I would constantly just be in, um, it was like a type of depression sometimes I couldn't even get out of bed. Um, and I didn't, I didn't understand w w what it was, but it, helped, it really gave me the calling to find God, which was beautiful, you know, gave me the gift. Sometimes, you know, our deepest feelings, like what Dave was talking about yesterday, about really feeling our feelings, is what really brings us back to the mind of God. And I, and I, I had to experience that. So as I, as I went on, 
I just kind of left it alone. I didn't think about the blue book anymore. And then um, six years later, I would go to Unity Church of Miami. And I walked in. Um, anybody from, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Unity Churches, right? So I walk into Unity Church, and I don't see crosses, and I see gay people and straight people and all colors, and everybody's one, and then, and different religions, and you're accepted no matter your creed, no matter what you do. It was like the sense of oneness. And then I said, wow, I am home. I am home. And one day I was there and I was at the bookstore and they said, there's a Course in Miracles group going on next door. And, I, and then I thought of the, you know, the Jewish lady with that book, we turned to us, <laughs> and A Course in Miracles, and I said, that's that blue book this lady was talking about. So I went to the introduction to the Course in Miracles. That was my first introduction to Course in Miracles. And this, this, this guy was giving an introduction and he says, you are not a victim of the world that you see, and you are responsible for your life. You're responsible for your experience. And I literally fell off my chair. I was like, what? It's just, wow. How many, have you, um, how many of you have felt that? Right, like, right? This is like, what? And then, but I knew, and I went back to when I was eight years old, because then I started to hear Holy Spirit again, and I remembered when I was eight, the Holy Spirit came to me and told me that I have an inner voice, right? And then I continued, and I'm sure a lot of people could relate to this, I'm going to fast forward the story, but I continued all my 20s, um, I think for a good 10 years, studying the, the course and going to course groups, and I was miserable. <laughs> miserable. I love the concepts, I think they were absolutely amazing, but again, it's in the practice. It's in living it. So what I would do is, is that I would read the lesson or I would express, I am love, right? I am love, but I feel unworthy. I am love, but I constantly look outside for love. I look for a man to complete me. I look for a romantic relationship for a man. I would actually, my vice, my thing, my grievance is men. I made men my God. If I, if I had that relationship, I was happy. Right? So I am love. So I'm going to this course group and I'm reading these things and I am, I'm, I'm not functioning at that loving place within my relationship with myself and others. And that's the key. Right? And then my career. My career defined me. You know? I got a job, I got a great job that uh, was out of maybe 300 girls I went to an audition. I went to work for, maybe most of you know this company, um, WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment, which, is, which, is, uh, which used to be WWF. And I would interview the wrestlers next to the ring. I would interview them. And I was so nervous. You know, I was in front of 20,000 people. I had to come down the jumbotron. I had to meet the guys and I have the IFB, the director, saying, you, got, you, you have only one chance to do this. You know, and then that's it. And I was like, okay. And I still hadn't got the contract yet. So you can imagine. So I, I, I was with, in the hotel room while I was touring with, with these shows. I did 41 shows. I ended up doing 41 shows and I ended up going to Albany, New York, and Lexington, Kentucky. And I remember in my hotel room having the Course of Miracles in the Bible. And I was so, I was searching. And no matter how much I read it, no matter how much I got down on my knees, I still experienced a sense of lack. I still experienced a sense of not being worthy. It's because I still identified myself as a body and a separated self. Me, 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 Maria, me, 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 the separated self. Right? I got to do this. I got to get this job. I have to be really good at this job. You know, I have to have a perfect relationship with, with the person I'm with. And me, I, I have to take care of all of this. And it, how, when all of this works out, how I how I said it's supposed to be, then I'm going to be happy. So I was suffering a lot. 
So a lot of people would say that I would be happy and successful, right? I have, you know, I have the job, you know, a job that a lot of people went, went out to get. You know, I have an amazing French boyfriend. <laughs> Baby! <laughs> Again, I didn't feel worthy of the relationship. I thought he was cheating on me left and right. You know, he might have been, but I was just believing all these things. I just, I wasn't comfortable, I wasn't happy. Then, something that I had always wanted, um, that, we all, that we always strive for because we think that's gonna be our happiness, is I said, okay, so I'm studying the course, remember, I'm studying the course, and then I said, well, you know what? I'm going to create a holy relationship and I'm gonna get married. myself of this, right? I'm going to get married, I'm going to have children. Right? And then 2009, I meet my ex-husband on um, a commercial of Home Depot. And we played husband and wife, actually, in the commercial. And we decided to make it, to try it out, to see if it would work in real life. And obviously, it didn't. And again, it was me thinking that this relationship, me getting married, is going to now give me my happiness. Right? So guess what I did? Since I already had my holy relationship, I stopped studying the Course of Miracles. How about that? <laughs> studying it constantly for many years, and then in 2009, after, you know, maybe, I think it was a good 10 years, I decided, no, I'm not gonna study the Course now. I'm just going to completely be tranced out by this man in front of me, and I'm going to make him my god and my idol and my everything. <coughs> Very sad. Very sad experience to, to constantly all your life be looking for the love of God outside of you, in your job, and I'm sure many, many people could relate in relationships, constantly looking for it outside and realizing that it's, it's right here. And I'm so grateful to him because it was him being in my life that brought me to be here today. So as I'm going through my divorce, I, things are not working out as I planned, you know, as I said it would. So what happens? What happens, what do we do? We go back to God. <laughs> we say, God, I don't want to decide, decide with you. I want to decide against you. We, we suffer. And then we're like, okay, we're back. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> I'm back. So the minister that had actually married my ex and I, um, Johannes, she was a Pathways of Light minister. And I called her up because I was very distraught. Because, you know, I thought I was going to be married forever and ever and ever. So she says, well, why don't you go to Pathways of Light Ministerial School so that you can um, know about the Course of Miracles better and use it as, you know, and be a minister, become a minister, Course of Miracles. I said, hell no, I'm not a minister. I'm an actress, I'm a TV host, I don't want to be a reverend. When she said reverend, I was like, no. Interesting, right? So I went online and I looked at Pathways of Light and I saw that the whole curriculum was based on, on, on the Course in Miracles and I absolutely um, have a love for it. So I said, what better way to learn the Course in Miracles and live it than going to a ministerial school that that's what they teach? So that got my attention. So I said, I'm gonna do that, but I'm not gonna be a reverend. I'm gonna be a minister, but I'm gonna do this for my healing. So I did, I jumped in with a lot of resistance and I began the journey of these, these courses and really going within and going within and being very destructive at the same time, right? Because I wasn't ready. So I was being, I was just very distracted, you know, with alcohol and, and partying and, and just anything not to, not, to, not to come back to truth, not to be in the mind of God, to be separate, right? And I was going to ministerial school. I was already. But it's interesting because the Holy Spirit's gonna meet you where you're at. So I kept on feeling nudged. 
So it's like, okay, you're not ready yet? All right. Kind of Holy Spirit's waiting for you in the sidelines. Okay, you, you, you know, I'm hanging out until you're ready. Right? So in, um, I started to go to Unity of Burbank, and um, one day I just said, hey, you know, I'm going to go to, I'm going to ministerial school. If one day the minister's not here, I would like to speak. And I have no idea why I said that, because remember I had said I didn't want to be a reverend or a minister, but I did do hosting, so I felt like, okay, I want to get up here and talk and share. And like a week, I thought they weren't going to call me. I mean, come on, I'm not even a, I'm not even a minister yet, you know? So they called me and they said, you know, the minister can't make it, so can you come on Sunday? And, I mean, I got so nervous, you know? I was like, what? Right? I got so nervous about it. And then I gave my first talk, and I just, I felt very comfortable. And then I wouldn't speak again till 2012 when, um, I, as soon as I got ordained. So I got ordained in 2012. And what I'm trying to share in the story is that in 2012, that's when my, I, I finally accepted my calling to be a reverend. I accepted my calling because there was just so many symbols. And that's what I want to share today is that when you have symbols, you feel nudges or you see just like they're so obvious. You know, when Unity calls me, and I'm not even a reverend yet, to do a service, that's already a symbol. And then they share with me, I went to um, one of their um, goals for 2012, and I told them that they should have a Spanish service. And not for me to do it, I just said I think they should have a Spanish service. And because I told them spirits speak Spanish too. You know? <laughs> and then I just forgot about it. And like a month later, the, the board, the president of the board said, hey, you know, why don't you do the Spanish service? I was like, inside of my mind, I was like, no, 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 I'm not a reverend, I'm not a minister, right? I, I said, Bob, I'm not even ordained yet. I won't be ordained till 2012 of November. They said, that's fine. We're okay with that. You can start it as soon as you, as you want. You can start. We, we prefer for you to start it next month. <laughs> so, I, I said, all right, I said, you know, I'm going to stop doing it my way. Maria the separated self. I'm going to stop doing it my way. Because my way, Maria the separated self with the little self, with the little s, just doesn't, just doesn't get it. Right? And feel sad. So let me try this. Let me listen. Let me listen. Let me trust. Right? How Cheryl was sharing that she trusted. This is why this, we're here. It's because she heard her call. And then when you trust, everything is at ease and grace. So there, become, there I, I get on the happy train. Are you guys ready to get on the happy train? Choo choo! I said, I, am, I, I need to get on this happy train. So then I get, I finally really dig deep into my studies and um, I get ordained. I started to let go of my vices. I started to let go of the partying thing and I started to really just um, dedicate myself to, to going within and spirit and of finishing my ministerial curriculum. So I got ordained in no November 2012. And this is when my purpose began. And this is why I'm here today. So I just want to go ahead and just thank my ex-husband, you know, because we have to be grateful. Because I feel that there's people in our lives that help us. They're angels that appear. He's my angel. That help us to really experience and see where we are in the mind of God. And when we recognize we're in the mind of God, then our purpose starts to unravel. And it doesn't really look like anything, it's just beingness. And then the opportunities start to show up. And you don't do it for the opportunities, you don't do it to really get anything. You do it for peace. Everything is just an experience. Right? I did that too long. You know, my career as an actress and TV host is like, I, well, that defined me. So when I became a reverend and a minister, I said, whoa, I had enough of that. Being a reverend doesn't define me. You know, not even, I, I'm actually going to share it now, now that this book is here. But um, this is The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. And here it says New World Library, and that's going to be my publisher, which is going to be my book is coming out next year. So I'm really, really excited. And... That, that doesn't define me. You know, I'm writing a book and it's not, 
I think Gary has said this before, that he's not really a writer or an author, and he doesn't like to, to write. Me neither, I really don't like it, but I like the way I feel afterwards, <laughs> all right? And the opportunity has come, all right, in ease and grace. So I wanted to share a couple of things that I feel kill our happy, because these are the ones that were killing my happy until 2012 I finally had this revelation. So one of them is, and one of them that's very present to me right now and really goes on with a lot of my friends that are around me is that you can't mess it up. You know, what kills your happy is that you feel you can mess it up, right? I have a girlfriend of mine that she was um, in a relationship and um, with this guy, she just met him actually and they were in New York having a really great time. And um, she's thinking, you know, she has of course, what kills your happy is also expectations, right? So she's expecting for this to go somewhere, you know? Every day is great, he seems like he's into her, everything's fine, and then when he's gonna leave her at the airport, she says, okay, we'll be in touch. And he says, okay, we'll, we'll play it by ear. <laughs> we'll play it by ear. That's when she was like, what? We don't even play it by ear. It hurts, right? It hurts your ego, it hurts, the, what hurts is the expectation. You know, the, what hurts is the meaning that you've given it. What hurts is that you're not trusting. What hurts is, is that it's not, it's not gonna be the way you want, which is what I suffered with, right? So she goes and she's, she's sharing with me and then what's, what's interesting is what we do in our mind because we, you know, we have these, this, these limit, limiting thought patterns that we need to let go of, that she's, she's starting to think now this whole thing that really kills her happy too, which is I should have, I could have, I wish I would have done it better. So now the guy says that he's gonna play by ear, and now she's saying, well, maybe I shouldn't have acted like I liked him that much. Right, wow. Maybe I shouldn't have said this if I would have done that. Then he would call me or be interested in me. This is how the ego plays with us. This is how we self-sabotage. This is how we kill our happy. And then we're not on the happy train. We suffer. And I'm giving this as an example, but just think of everything in your life that you give expectations to, like I should've, I would've, I could've, I wish I would've done it better, and how much you suffer. Instead of trusting. That is exactly perfect. And that he doesn't want to reach out to her or talk is exactly perfect. Right? And the way that she was, and I told her, I said, Pilar, it's exactly perfect. It is. And there's something just so freeing about, about that, just like here we're at the Freedom Retreat. There's something so freeing about just saying it's exactly perfect. Even if in form it doesn't appear so. We decide with God when we are seeing in Christ's vision. All right, feeling our feelings. Um, yeah, when we're, when we're, we're spiritual, we just, oh, I'm not going to feel my feelings because, you know, I'm spiritual and, you know, I don't want to go into the past because, you know, the past is over. You know? And there's something to be said about feeling your feelings and, and going to that space and, and, and being there so that you can... I had to go through whatever I had to go through and feel whatever I had to feel to really be here today and to experience my happiness, you know? And it's gonna be uncomfortable. I'm not gonna say it's comfortable. I love yesterday how, um, I think, you know, Gary shares this in the Disappearance of the Universe in his books as well about feeling, but also David had brought it up yesterday that he said in regards to that at the monastery, they really are honest and just share, you know, what, what's going on. They're very authentic. You know, I really feel authenticity is very sexy. Don't you think so? It's like, it's nice. When somebody's being authentic, you're able to experience it, right? It's nice. It's, it's beautiful to be able to really see somebody and they're not pretending. It's like, wow, I get to be with you right now. I really get to experience you right now. So, me personally, I had to start to really get real about these feelings of unworthiness, looking for my happiness outside, because even though I was a minister, I was still working on these issues that I had with men, 
right? I'm still working on them. And just because I'm a reverend doesn't mean, you know, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm still working on stuff right now as I, as I stand here, right? So I met, I met the Buddha guy, Buddhist guy. I'll match. <laughs> This, this thing that I need to make this work, right? What was, what was curious about this time around, after the work that I had done with the course and really practicing what I'm, I'm, what I'm learning and what I'm sharing, is that I didn't do that. I was with my feelings. And I felt my sadness. And I was collapsing time of my past, of all the grievances I had with men, and just doing the same thing over and over again and looking for my happiness in men. So I started to just feel this, this need of completion because I needed to, to call him so that he can, he can fix things for me. And I just went and I felt those feelings. The first day was hard. Um, the second day was hard. And the third day was hard. And then I just, and then by a week I was, I was fine. And that was very pivotal for me because I feel that sometimes, and I'm saying this to all of us, it's easy to think that our feelings need to rule us, or we need to take action because we feel a certain way, we need to write that email, we need to write that text, we need to fix this. And instead of just being with the feeling and handling it with Holy Spirit, and handling it within the mind of God and realizing that you're not separate, and me realizing I don't need a man to be happy, I don't need this person to fill me. I am full. And then I was free. I haven't had a, a long relationship, um, I would say a lengthy relationship, since I got divorced in 2009, and I know why. I know why I'm appearing to be single is because I needed to heal my grievances with men, heal this attachment to making men my God by appearing to be single. I'm very aware of that. And I've also got um, insights that I'm saving myself a lot of time of suffering. 
by experiencing and just going within and just appearing to be single. So now, um, through this experience of being single, I'm able to experience something that I wasn't open to experiencing before, which is inclusive love. I had exclusive love. My mom was everything, my boyfriend was everything. It was like, that's what it was. Now, as a minister and having my congregation and having all my beautiful mighty companions, I get to experience this inclusive love that just blows my mind. And that really matters. Trust is something, um, Cheryl brought this up yesterday, that if we're being trusting, I had to be trusting with that Buddha guy situation, I had to be trusting with starting my ministry and not being a minister, I had to be trusting of my new calling, you know, being a, a TV host and an actress for 18 years and, and stepping into my purpose of being, um, of finally deciding to work for God. I was asked to work for God when I was eight, I just didn't listen. And I began to work for God in 2012. And then I always say God is my boss. Right? So I had to start to develop trust and not and not manipulate or try to make happen anymore and just and just allow. And I don't really I'm not you start to just not really become concerned with anything. And if something shows up, you know, one of the big things that kills our happy is the big deals. Right? Big deals. What are, you, what are you making real? Right? So when, what happens is, is that when we make that letter from the IRS real, what happens? You suffer. Because you're making a big deal. Oh my God, society has taught me that this IRS thing is really important and, and, and this is a very big deal. And then you, you're not happy. You know, I get some, some, once in a while, well, I mean, I've gotten one that, you know, when you're on the expressway, uh, sometimes, at least in Los Angeles, and I don't know how they do this, but you get into this lane and you can't get out of it, and, and you're supposed to pay for that lane. It's like a fast lane. But then you're on it, and I couldn't get off. So then I get a ticket for that. Because they, they take your picture. On a license plate. And then you have a fine. Right? But this is this is when you're when you're really practicing living the course, it's like you decide with God and not against God. And everything if I would make that letter real, I'm separating and I'm I'm I'm, I'm believing in illusion. I'm believing that I'm I'm not perfect. I'm believing that I could be harmed. I'm believing that I could be guilty. I'm believing that I could get a ticket. I'm believing that I'm bad. So I see the ticket and I read a letter saying, I got on the thing, I didn't know. I was just honest, right? I mean, we still do our worldly things. It's not like we stop life. We do, we, we do things, but you do it in joy, right? You do it in joy. Oh, I got to take it. Let me write this letter. Let me see what happens. I'm just going to say, hey, I, I wrote a letter. I got on the thing. I couldn't get out. I don't know why you guys make this like this. I wrote like that. I couldn't get out of it. It's my first time. I'm new to Los Angeles. Then what we do when we have a problem and we, we address it, what do we do? Let it go. We let it go. We don't think about it anymore. Right? I don't think about it anymore. A month passes, I get I get the, the, the letter from um, the county again, and then and then I remember. I remember, oh, that's right. So then I get it and then I'll say, you know, this is your first offense, so we'll we'll let it go. Or I'll give you credit, or you don't have to wait for the ticket. Right? Now there's something very important here, which is happiness. And the ego would say that your happiness would be, my happiness is that, wow, this ticket, right? I, I don't have to pay it, so, oh my God, now I'm happy. I got a result. My job, I'm grateful, I'm not saying I'm not grateful, my job is to be happy regardless if I got that credit or not, regardless if it's about the ticket or not. That's my job. Right? Those are, you don't do things to, to get stuff in the world. We do what we do because we want peace. That's why it's always peace first. It's not, oh, I want the job. I want peace. 
right? I have a lot of people that sometimes come up to me and they want to pray. You know, oh my God, I just put down this amount of money for this lease, and please pray for me, because I want this apartment. I said, I'm going to pray with you, but I'm not going to pray for you to have an apartment. I'm going to pray for you to have peace. Because regardless if you get the apartment or not, you're going to have peace. Because we need to, if we want to constantly be living our happy, we need to get out of our way of, of wanting to manipulate, of wanting to make happen, of, of, of getting out of our way of what we think is the best. What we think is the best. Our separated self thinks is the best. And come back to the mind of God, where we reside always and forever. I've never left. And that space is where we experience our happy place. When we come back to the mind of God, now remember, God creates. It's creating, 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 creating. Love, 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 love. That is what God is. is creation. Creating. Ego makes. Let me make this happen. Let me make, let me make this happen. When I'm creating, it's a different energy. Because love creates, love creates, love creates, love creates, love. And that's the experience that we have here at this freedom retreat. Love creates, love creates, love creates, love. Why? Because the foundation of this retreat is based on trust. So we're very lucky because we get to practice that. Because we have a beautiful symbol of that here, by being here. Let me make sure I didn't leave anything out in regards to, oh, yeah. Lack of discipline. So, of course, Miracle says you're too, oh, you're too something with regards of you're okay with mind wandering, right? Too far too tolerant of mind wandering. Many of you guys would know. <laughs> far too tolerant of mind wandering. Discipline is what it took for me to begin to live my happy at a ten. Right? Because before, when I did, or when I was not being aware of my thoughts and choosing Holy Spirit, one day I would feel really good, and then the next day I would feel like shit. Do you, do, you, do you get that feeling? You know, sometimes like, oh my God, I'm so happy, and then the next day you're, you're not feeling as good. And I used to be like that all the time. I used to just have these like big cry attacks, and then one day I'll be happy. You know? And then I would be happy, and then I'll be like, oh my God, let me feel this, and let me be here, because I don't know when this is going to go away. <laughs> this happiness, right? So we need to begin to have discipline, and this is where... Um, you know, Gary's book, The Disappearance of the Universe, comes in because it was very practical, very, it made me, it helped me to be able to understand the practicing, how to practice the, the principles better. I actually was reading The Disappearance of the Think about it now, The Disappearance of the Universe when I was married. But then I just put it down after. And then I started to study it after that, right? Because it's all we're ready, right? So, there's, there's something to say about. People always tell me, well, Maria, how, how did you finally be able to, to experience this happiness and not be defined by the world anymore? And then I always say, what I feel, this is actually something I'm writing in my book, is that, um, ready, I'm ready. It's like the sensation of I'm ready. I'm ready. And it's not like I'm ready, but. It's like, I am ready. I am ready to live in the mind of God. I am ready not to judge any longer. I am ready not to look for my happiness outside. I am ready to feel worthy. I am ready to feel the love of God. I am ready to release all the illusion. I'm ready to let go of all my grievances. I am ready. I am ready to forgive. I am ready to see things differently. I am ready. It took something. It took something. And I had to get to this space of where you're seeing my emotion now to be like, I want to experience my function of happiness, period, no matter what. And I'm going to step into it, even though I have, I'm going to have to go whatever I need to go to, but I'd rather go through whatever I need to go through instead of be living tranced out. Be living like a puppet. Dying. Not really living. Deciding against God. Right? I want to feel this. Whatever it is. And I want to heal it. 
So there needs to be discipline. I have many people that come to me, you know, when I'm doing spiritual counseling and when I'm doing workshops, and they say, I, I want to change. You know, I want to I, I, I be happy. And then I'll give them something to do during the week, and then they'll come back the next week, and, and I'll be like, what did you journal? What happened? And they're like, I didn't do it. There's like this lack of discipline, you know, and it's okay. And it's not bad or good, it's exactly perfect for where you're at, and that's good. Although be aware of what you're doing. Be vigilant of your mind. Be aware of your mind. Who's running the show there? Why are you not, why are you not journaling if it's helpful? Right? Sitting with yourself, listening to Holy Spirit, asking questions and journaling. That's something that's helpful, right? Because you have something better to do, right? You have to go, you know, go to the movies. You have to go meet your friends. You know, you have a job, and you know, you have other, other better things to do than to be really happy. <laughs> what? Clean the closet. Clean the closet. <laughs> My mind is sometimes, it happens to me sometimes that I'm meditating, and I start thinking, I'm Cuban, and I start thinking of black beans and rice. <laughs> And then I'm like, okay, I'll think about that later. I'll eat that later, right? <laughs> but it's amazing. We're constantly being distracted all the time. Constantly being distracted. Constantly being distracted. This is why we start to have discipline. Just like when we go to the gym and we work out, how we start to see a difference in our body when we start to have this inner inner dialogue with Holy Spirit. You see that the whole the ego speaks the first and speaks the loudest. So when you start to cultivate this relationship with Holy Spirit, you start to experience the guidance of Holy Spirit more. But you need to choose that every day. The second within the second. What are you thinking? All right, how am I feeling? You know, you know when you are choosing ego, not only by the peace that you feel or you don't feel peace, it's also what when you're judging. When you're judging what you've created. So you see the illusion and then you judge the illusion. So if you're judging somebody outside, then you know that you're ego. You know, that person's not doing it right. Or, if you love me, you would be different, right? You would act different. Then you know, wow, I am placing judgment on this person, or I'm imposing on this person. That is not love. Who's running the show right now? Ego. All right, good. Guess what? Don't crucify yourself, right? Hell, you know what? I chose ego. All right, I choose again. I choose spirit again. Let's be gentle. Let's be gentle to the process, right? I chose ego, now I choose Holy Spirit. Right? So, um, I'm, I'm very excited because in January, as I was sharing, I, I got a book deal with um, um, Gary Bernard. Gary Bernard, public, uh, Gary Bernard's publisher is uh, D. Patrick Miller that published The Disappearance of the Universe. And um, I had posted on Facebook one night I had a glass of Pinot Noir, <laughs> and I wrote an excerpt, an excerpt on Facebook, and, and, I, and I put excerpt from my book. You know, I thought it sounded good, like it could be in a book. So I literally put excerpt from my book, right? So um, a couple, you know, a couple of days later, I got a Facebook message from Patrick that says, hey, um, I see they wrote a book, and I get very interested in what Course in Miracles teachers are, 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 are writing or have a book, so why don't you contact me? And then I was like, oh my god, I don't have a book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a book, and, and I'm not a writer, I'm not an author either, so no thank you. So I didn't write back. So if you wrote back, you wrote me an email a couple, a couple, another couple of days after. Yeah, I wrote you on Facebook, and um, and I, I wanted to know about your book. And then when I read the email, I was like, oh my god, I don't have a book. The third thing on war. What did I get myself into? You see, so happens when you drink wine. Stay off the internet, texting when you are under the influence. Of Um, I, I, I wrote to him and I said, you know, Patrick, I really am honored and I'm happy that you wrote to, you know, wrote to me in regards to the book, but, you know, 
I don't have a book. <laughs> I don't have a book, and, um, and I'm not an author, I'm not a writer, you know, it's not my thing. Just like the whole thing with the minute, again, it's coming up. I don't want to be a reverend, I don't want to be a minister, no, I don't want to be a writer, right? But there's signs, there's symbols. So we got on the phone, and he, he, he convinced me, um, you know, he kind, of, he kind of, he told me that if we could do a book proposal, that, that would work, and I wouldn't have to write like a chapter or two, and then kind of present it to, you know, to the publishers. And, and that caught my attention, and I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. And the only reason I really did it is because I felt comfortable with him, and I, I felt like he would, he would help me. Um, you know, again, my security started to come up, you know, because I thought I was a writer, I, had this, I grew up with dyslexia, I don't like reading. I read the, which is weird because I read The Course of Miracles, and it's very heavy, but I just, I don't like reading. Like, when I'm reading the first line, I want to already finish to the bar. I'm just a week early to that. Like, when is this going to be? Or, when is it? or I start to look like when the chapter's going to be done. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I needed to start to just, uh, you know, had to get out of my own way again. And, um, and again, just say this is not about me. You know, if it was about me, Maria, the separated self, then of course I would get nervous or, or I would be worried. What, what would I say in the book and all this stuff? But when I, I got out of my own way and I allow, I allow spirit to, to move through me and just share the love and my experiences and how to practice this stuff, um, I, I, don't, I don't get nervous and I just let it go. It's that, and then it doesn't define me. So when it was turned into Hay House in December, which is actually the publisher that we had in mind, um, they said no. And it's funny because when Patrick called me and told me that Hay House had accepted the book, I was, I was in joy. Because I didn't have any expectations. You see, this is how I live in my happiness. I want the book where the book is going to be more soulful. Why would I want the book to be somewhere where it's not going to, where they don't want it? Which is fine. It's exa again, it's exactly perfect. Right? And you see, I could suffer there. I could have made that very real. But I decided not to. I said, and Patrick said, what I'll do is in the first, the beginning of the first, you know, January, the first week, I'll send out some book proposals and see what happens. And then um, the first, that first week, I had gotten two, two offers. Two offers. One was New World Library, which, is, which published Power of Now and Deepak Chopra Books and another publisher. And, and then I, I stepped into it. And the reason I share this story is because I, I, one of my, my biggest things is that it's normal for things to be easy. You know, it's normal. We think that things need to be hard. Right? And the book is a big example of that. You know, I mean, I could have made it hard. Like, I'm not a writer, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I just was taking step by step by step by step. And just trusting and trusting and trusting and trusting. So when you are in your daily lives and you are making things very real, I just want to say that you're going to suffer a lot. But when you are playing and enjoy and just kind of exploring like a little kid your, your, your dream, everything becomes in ease and grace and flows, literally, like in every aspect, you know. I, and it's, I'm, a, I'm a perfect example of that. I, I never set out to do what I'm doing right now. I never set out to write a book, any of it. I just, I stepped into my calling. And, and the most important thing, and if it's all, if it's all gone tomorrow, which it's not even really here, I'm really in the mind of God. Um, it's okay. Because again, it doesn't define me. And that's how I felt about the book when, when I got the book to you. It's like, even if the book doesn't happen, I, I don't care. I've done that too long. That what's outside defines me. And that if I don't have that, I'm sad. Peace is what I want. Peace first.